30th chapter of the book of Exodus. Beginning with verse 31, also we'll read Psalms 92. Exodus chapter 30. I want to say I appreciate all the fine men that I've been able to work with through the years. Brother Pugh, my very dear friend, we work together in Texas across the country. I love Brother Pugh. Brother Kenny, we have been so close through the years. Wonderful friendship. I appreciate these fine men of God. Brother Travis, good to see you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, This shall be an holy anointing oil. Everybody say, Holy Anointing Oil. Unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it. After the composition of it, it is holy. It shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compoundeth anything any like it, or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto these sweet spices, Stacti, and Onica, Galbranon, these sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight. Thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection, after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. Thou shalt eat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. Psalms chapter 92. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night, upon an instrument of ten strings, upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered, but my horn shalt thou not exalt, shalt thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Everybody say it. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Say it again. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Let us pray again. Father, we come in your name. And we need you, and we love you, and we want you, and we worship you, and we thank you for what we have felt and seen and heard. Thank you for the touch of God upon this place and upon the hearts of your people. Now, Lord, one more time, would you help us? One more time, may we feel that strength of the Lord. One more time, may we feel the divine touch of the loving hand of a wonderful, loving God. Bless us and help us, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You can be seated. Because of the times of fresh anointing. The thing that makes a church effective and the thing that makes an individual effective in the church and the thing that makes a minister effective in the work of God is that holy anointing that comes upon him from heaven. I have been greatly anointed at times 
I have been anointed at times. I have been anointed a little bit at times. There have been times I have not been anointed. I just went through the motions on those times. I know what it is, and I know when it is not there. I know what it is to feel it, and I know what it is to feel for it. Now, this this is a, a message that I preached. The very first sermon that I ever preached was entitled, Oil. And I stepped to the pulpit in Bible college to give my little message on oil. I read my text. I could not lift my eyes up from the book. I felt like I wished there was a hole I could fall in. I stumbled and stuttered and staggered for three or four minutes. I said, everybody, close your eyes and bow your heads. Nobody looking. And I disappeared. They had stairs at the back of that platform, and I slipped down those stairs while everybody was bowing their head. I know when they looked up that they didn't think the rapture had taken place because they knew me too well. And I hid in one of the rooms in the basement of that church, and I didn't want to see anybody, and I wanted to go home. I mean home, home. Not dormitory home, but home, home. And so finally, uh, one of the seniors in school found me. He said, I've been looking everywhere for you. He said, where have you been? What are you doing? I said, I'm trying to hide from everybody. Well, he said, uh, it's not all that bad. He said, really, though, you shouldn't have chosen a subject like that. Well, that really helped a whole lot. So I've been afraid to preach on oil for all of these years. But I do have a pulpit big enough to hide inside of tonight. No, seriously, I just feel that there is something that we need desperately and that we are receiving. And that is a special anointing for these times that we're in. I feel that God gave me something this afternoon. I hope he will let me share it with you in just a little while. But I would say here now, the anointing makes the difference. But to understand the special anointing oil, we need to go back to the beginnings of any subject. What, that's one of the laws of interpretation. Go to the beginning. See where it was first used, how it was used. If you look in the 28th, 29th, 30th chapters of the book of Exodus, you find the beginnings of the holy anointing oil. The description of the garments for the priest was quite elaborate, colorful, expensive, very beautiful. They went into detail. There had to be special work done. It could not be done any other way, only than that that God had commanded. Every little detail had to be put in place. Not only that, the priest that wore that garment, his body had to be washed. He had to be so clean and so pure to be in the office of priesthood. Then with the proper dress and the proper condition, as far as his physical was concerned, he was called to the tabernacle, the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And before he could go inside of the door of that tabernacle of that congregation, he had to be anointed with holy anointing oil. I wonder what it would be like if God required every minister of the gospel before you walk through the doors of that building to stand behind that pulpit to minister the Word of God. You make sure that holy anointing oil has been poured out upon you. I was one of those who grew up to fear God. I was reared in a home that was God-fearing. I saw a minister all my life who was a God-fearing minister. He never took the work of God lightly. Uh, the only way I ever remember seeing my dad was with a Bible in his hand or on his knees praying or preaching the gospel or sitting in the middle of the floor putting a tent together or driving tent stakes and putting up tents. That, that's about the only way I ever remember seeing that man 
I do remember when he would stand to that pulpit. I do remember something would happen to that congregation. There was something that came forth from him. There was something that flowed from him. I grew up knowing that it had to be that way. It could not be any other way. That's why it was so hard for me to get started preaching. I had no ability. I had no special talent. I was scared half to death. I was afraid of the pulpit. I was afraid to preach. I, it was so sacred to me. I could not take it lightly. I would pray four hours a day. I never got up off of my knees if I was going to have to preach. I spent four hours on my knees praying. Four hours I didn't get up and walk around. I didn't move around. I thought I had to stay on my knees four straight hours. I fasted every other day. I wanted to be serious in the work of God. I wanted the anointing. I cannot stand here tonight and tell you that I was a great evangelist or a great preacher or a great anything because I did those things. Even through that, it was a struggle and a battle, and I fought everything within me to have the touch of God upon my heart. I will confess to you tonight, I do not pray today like I prayed then. I do not fast today like I fasted then. But I will tell you the reason I am standing here tonight is because I can look back to those years, even though I was not heavily anointed. I can look back to those years, the hours of prayer, the days of fasting and trying to get the foundation that I needed for the work of God. And I'm not here to tell you tonight that after you reach a certain age, you get away from that. No, never. My wife and I have talked so much here of late. Our schedules are so busy. We've got to find a way to get along with God. I am hungry for that. I felt it today. It moved in the deep of my heart and my spirit today. It drove me to my knees. It has talked to me. Thank God for that anointing. I want it. Before you go into the door of the tabernacle of that congregation, you've got to be anointed with that holy anointing oil. What was this anointing oil? What made it so different, so special? Well, the instructions was given to Moses. Special ingredients were to be put in it. First of all, the oil was made from the choice olives. Before the oil could come, those olives had to be beaten and beaten and beaten very small so that the oil could come forth. With that oil, there was myrrh, cinnamon, calamus, and cassius, special spices. Myrrh came from a little thorny bush that the only way you could get the myrrh, it had that bush had to be crushed, broken, and literally crushed so that that sap could exclude from that thorny bush. Cinnamon was the rind of the tree that had to be beaten with a heavy object, beaten and beaten and beaten until the sweet spice began to come from it. The calamus was a sweet cane-like substance, but that had to be squeezed and uh, bent and broken before that sweet spice could come out. The cassius was an aromatic root that had also to be beaten. So with your oil, with your myrrh, your cinnamon, your cassius, your calamus, all of these ingredients, in order to have the holy anointing oil, it had to be crushed, broken, beaten to the very depths in order for them to get it together. And then when they finally mixed it together, it was not just a little bottle of oil. I carry a little bottle of oil around in my pocket because people are constantly calling on a preacher for prayer. And I carry it with me. It was not a bottle like this. The Bible tells us it was a hen of oil. A hen was six quarts. With all of these spices mixed together with six quarts of oil, that priest stood in the door of the tabernacle of that congregation, and six quarts of that oil was poured out upon his head. You say, wouldn't that leave those beautiful garments in a mess? 
Wouldn't it make it oily? Would that not uh, do something to mar his garments? That special oil would soon evaporate. But when that oil flowed down the garments and on the head and on the beard, even though it would evaporate, the sweet spices remained in the garment and in the beard and on the head. So that when that man ministered for the Lord, there was a sweetness that came from his preaching and from his teaching and from the Word of the Lord. Oh, God help us to realize there are, there are too many times that we try to to get by without that holy anointing oil. And many times we try to use the Word of God to beat people over the head. We want to line somebody up, and we want to tell them just like it is. When you tell them like it is, make sure there is an aroma of sweetness of the spices and perfume that goes along with that holy anointing oil. Amen. God's standard was that it had to be exact. There had to be a balance. All of these had to be balanced. In our work for God, our lives must be balanced. Don't be overbalanced in things. I thank God for my friends who have helped keep me in balance through the years. When you want to go off on a tangent and ride a hobby horse to death, uh, thank God there are those that can help you and strengthen you so that your life can be balanced. And God had a standard. The standard for that had to be a certain way. The standard of the Old Testament is the same for the New. Be ye holy, for I am holy. This oil was not to be duplicated. Don't you try to make any of that oil for yourself. Don't try to put any of that perfume on yourself. You're trying to duplicate what God required for a special anointing. There are too many times, I think, that we try to duplicate. If we cannot pray down the power of God, a lot of times we try to use trickery and we try to use psychology to produce the same result. Many times, if we cannot get results in the name of Jesus, we want to use the name that Paul preached. We don't have the personal experience for ourselves, and it's not burning in our heart. If we cannot preach to see results many times, we will use substitutes because we don't have that holy anointing oil upon our hearts. There were three words that were used. The purpose for it all is so they can be consecrated, so they can be sanctified, and so they can be made holy, consecrated, sanctified, and made holy. And so I would say at the beginning right now, the purpose of this holy anointing oil was the anointing of preparation that brought a special separation. If you're going to do anything for God sometime or another in your life, You've got to have the anointing of preparation. Praise God. Preachers, it's a dirty shame when you can stay all day on the road somewhere and all day in the field somewhere and all day on a basketball court somewhere and all day on the fishing bank somewhere and come in 30 minutes before church and grab a concordance and try to get up there and feed those precious people of God. You need the holy anointing oil upon you to be able to minister the Word of God effectively. The anointing of preparation goes on and on. Time you spend in Bible college is not wasted. The world is lost. We know it is. We want to get in a hurry to save it. But your hours in the classroom of preparation are important. What if Jesus comes? He will come while you're preparing. He'll come while you're busy. Don't ever think you've got to cut the corners to get out there. Prepare your heart. Let the love of God dwell within you. Get the Word of God deep within you. And then go forth and stand in the door of the tabernacle and wait for the anointing to come upon you. Then when you preach the Word of God, you can be effective and can see results. First Peter 2 and 10, you're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, every one of us. Royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, 
that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. First Peter 2 and 5, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. If you want to offer up a spiritual sacrifice that is acceptable, make sure that we have that holy anointing oil upon our lives. We need the anointing to be able to worship. You are a chosen generation. Every one of us are in this tonight. For Aaron and his sons to exercise their ministry, they had to be anointed with the oil of preparation, a fresh anointed. In Psalms 92.10, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I have found out through my years of experience what I cannot do with committees, what I cannot do with boards, what I cannot do with programs, if somehow I can get the anointing of the Lord, if somehow that certain something starts flowing upon us, then I know that something will happen. There will be a sweet fragrance that will fill the building. It will be like Mary's alabaster box, oil of spikenard, very costly, very precious. But when it is open and it releases, there is a sweet perfume and a sweet odor that fills the room. Everybody sees it. Everybody feels it. Everybody can witness it. And oh, there's something about it. When we get to exalting the name of the Lord and worshiping Him and lifting up Jesus, all of a sudden the sweet fragrance of the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley is there and the root and the offspring of David and the stem out of the rod of Jesse. It fills the building and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Praise God. We allow the sweetness of the anointing to come into the place it can do more than we can do in a moment, in a lifetime. Psalms 45 and 8. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces where they made thee glad. Thank God. When that priest, after the oil evaporated, he passed by the congregation. They said, there goes our priest. We can smell the sweetness. It's there. It's upon the garments. You don't have to tell people when you're anointed. I know that I've done it. I've said, oh, I'm anointed. They can tell it. You don't have to tell anybody. Amen. They know when it's not. They know when it is, too. They'll go along with you. If they love you, they'll tell you it's good. But they know when you're anointed. They know when that certain something happens. When Moses came down off of that mouth, that congregation knew that he was anointed. He had to put a handkerchief over his face. It shone with the anointing and the presence and the power of God. Stephen was stoned and they looked upon his face and it shone like that of an angel. There was an anointing upon him. There was the holy presence of God upon him. There was the power of God upon his life. My dad went into a new place to preach one time, many, many years ago. He and my mother went on a 21-day prayer revival, 30-day prayer revival, excuse me. They prayed from 12 to 14 hours every day before they started their meeting. And the people, some of the older people of that little town told me when I went back to preach the 50th anniversary of that church, they said, when your dad stepped to the pulpit that first night in that school building, they looked at him and started weeping all over the congregation. There was a brightness of the glory in the presence of God that, that shone through his countenance. He had been with Jesus 12, 14, 16 hours. And when he stepped to the pulpit, his preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but there was a demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. Man's faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Men began to weep and fall at their seats and cry out to God. Eighteen people received the Holy Ghost that first night. 
He walked into the building the second night, and they started weeping again when he stood at the pulpit. There was the holy anointing oil that was upon his countenance. They could see it. Eight. Eighteen more people received the Holy Ghost that very night, and the whole town was stirred. People were receiving the Holy Ghost. The picture show had to close down. Uh, the, the pool hall had to close down. There was no other activity going on in that town because there was an apostolic revival, an apostolic preacher with apostolic anointing upon his soul. Hallelujah! Oh. Thank God for the fresh anointing oil. Leave this place with that fresh anointing oil. When that meeting was over, the Methodist pastor and his wife had received the Holy Ghost. And every member of that assembly had been baptized in Jesus' name. They did not have to rent a building or start a building or build a building. They just took the name off of the church. First Methodist Church and put Pentecostal Church upon there because every one of those good Methodists who were honest hearted and hungered for more of God, when they saw the reality, they were broken, they were melted, they received their wonderful experience with God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm hungry for that fresh oil. I'm hungry for that fresh oil. Notice it's not to be poured out upon man's flesh. It's on his garments. It's on his head, but not on his flesh. And I'm here to tell you tonight, we have tried too many times in the energy of the flesh to get the job done. If we couldn't do it in preaching, we wanted a victory march. And I'm not against victory marches. If we couldn't get it through the Word of God because we had not really applied ourselves like we should. We wanted people to turn handsprings and be acrobats in a service. Oh, let me tell you something. What victory marches can't do and what jumping can't do, I'm here to tell you the anointed Word of God can do it ten times out of ten. It will happen if you please. Don't ever think you can do it through the energy of the flesh. Romans 8, 5 and 8. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You start manipulating through the flesh, there's no stopping place. Paul said in Galatians 3 and 3, Having begun in the Spirit, are you made perfect through the flesh? No way. No way. Hallelujah. I remember the spirit of that Brush Arbor meeting, Brother Mike Hudson, where your father received the Holy Ghost, where I received the Holy Ghost. I remember the spirit of that Brush Arbor meeting. I remember the anointing of the Lord that came upon that place. We begun in the spirit. There is no way we can be made perfect through the flesh. You can pamper it and powder it and perfume it and make it look good and do everything you want to with it, educate it and all of that. But you better stand in the door of the tabernacle and wait for six quarts of that anointing oil with the sweet spices to be poured out upon you. Praise God. I don't know how to operate without the Spirit. I told the Lord today, I, Lord, I don't want to preach tonight. I don't know how to preach. You've got to help me. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost came upon me. In psychology, they have what is called Skinnerian psychology, which has stimulus and responses. You put forth some kind of stimuli, and you get some kind of response. Certain inputs of stimuli will automatically bring responses. I'm sorry to tell you folks, but I have seen some preachers in my time that learn to operate through Skinnerian psychology, mind control. They knew exactly how to manipulate people. They knew exactly how to get them to do what they did at the time they wanted it done. 
They had chauffeurs that chauffeured them around. They had bodyguards that surrounded them. They had men that carried their coats for them and opened the door for them. They became a little god operating through Skinnerian psychology. Oh, but those people come to a dead end street after a while. They come to the end of their road after a while. They run out of their manipulations after a while. But I'm here to tell you when that holy anointing oil comes upon you and it runs all over you, you never run out of that. It never runs dry. There's always a new supply. God's way is still not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.29, No flesh shall glory in his presence. Isaiah 30 and 1, Warn to you that come with a covering and not of my spirit, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that go down into Egypt to get your help and your strength. Amen. John 6, 63, the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the Spirit that quickeneth the words that I speak unto you. They are Spirit, and they are life. Hallelujah. That's what I want. Oh, glory. Warn to him who maketh flesh his arm. Trust is in the arm of flesh. Some folks say that means going to doctors and trust. doesn't mean that at all. That just simply means that you know how to do it with the flesh. You can trust the flesh to do it. I don't know how to do anything in the flesh. There's one preacher, if he didn't have the help of God, he's sunk. I don't know how to use psychology, but I do know when God's presence comes. I know when His power is manifested. I know when His Spirit begins to move. Hallelujah! Glory to God! At Jerusalem conference, I got to teaching our bus on the way to church one night. That song, Brother Stone King taught. Oh, come, let's sing. Let us rejoice. They listened to me a while, and then they learned it. And we got to singing, and that old bus got to rocking. Even that Jewish driver got to patting his foot and and patting his hand on the steering wheel. When we walked up and parked there by that auditorium, I said, I'll tell you what I want everybody on this bus to do. I want you to walk out of this bus and into the auditorium singing that song. They walked up the steps singing, Oh, come, let's sing. Let us rejoice. Oh, come, let's sing. Let us rejoice. Messiah's come, and he brought life. And he put laughter into my soul. We got into that auditorium, and we just kept singing it. I went to the microphone. It wasn't time to start service, and uh, the Spirit of God began to move. And people in the audience began to sing it. First thing you know, they were rocking from one side of that building to the other. First thing you know, those missionaries, those native workers were out in the aisles. They were shouting. They started a victory march. That went... One God is a treasure chest. Understand the one God. You open up the treasure chest of other great gifts from this God. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Moses told that the daily diet of the Jews would be to hear every morning, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thousands, a few thousand of years later, Jesus is asked by some men, Would you tell us what is the greatest commandment of all, the first and the greatest. He said, it is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is no disputing the one God doctrine. Throughout the Bible, thousands of times, over 7,000 times to be exact, The Bible refers to God as being one God, one Lord.